I'm gonna I'm gonna get started here because it seems like we have so little time to cover the entire history of ancient Israel. So, you know, so, we, so um, but anyway, it, I I wanted to start by asking if you know from last week, did you you know if you had a chance to reflect on anything that we talked about? Did you have any questions or or even observations about the material we discussed? The, the, the presentation on your whiteboard was actually, you mentioned, the schematic was so helpful yeah. in yeah. allowing us to understand uh -huh. this concept of moving from the gods to man. It was yeah. very good. Right. Well, thank you. I I, I always have to draw. <laughs> but, uh, I, and I found that Hastings College, the students, really liked it. In fact, then when the age of cell phones came along, they would go up and they'd take their pictures <laughs> <laughs> the board, you know, so... So out there, I have my lectures, uh, you know, that have been uh, memorialized, I guess. So <laughs> thank you, Holly. I appreciate that very much. Um, we are, in this three weeks, we want to look at the history of Israel. Um, and when I say that, I, I want you to think in your mind about something that's a little different. Because when we talk about a nation, we usually think of a nation as a geopolitical entity, right? So when I say Israel, many people today will think naturally, well, you know, the, the land that is right there in the what used to be called the Levant or, you know, present-day Palestine slash Israel. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about something that's absolutely unique, really, in the history of the world, of people who maintain an identity apart from their uh, geopolitical location. And the, the Hebrew Bible was written in such a way, I'm, I, I mentioned last week, I'm reading this wonderful book called Why the Bible Began. I cannot remember the author's name, but it's a pretty, pretty good book. But his whole thesis is just this, is that when we read and the text that we're reading, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, however you want to refer to it, we're reading a, a collection of narratives that try to give people a sense of identity that is somehow not necessarily rooted you know, in the land that is so uh, important to so many other uh, national identities, right? Israel was a nation and has been a nation for 3,000 years regardless of place. That's really, really unique. I mean, if you can think about the Ashkenazic Jews in Eastern Europe, you can think about the uh, Sephardic Jews in, uh, in let's say, present-day Spain. You can think about Jews in South America all over the world. They're all a nation. They're a nation that does not necessarily established in a place. Now, since 1946, there's been an opportunity for them to be established in a place. Uh, and that's when a UN resolution was made that, uh, you know, that, that area known as Palestine would be divided between Palestinians and Israelis. And thus, they became something that for many hundreds of years, they never were able to be. And that is a nation in a place. And of course, we know how that has brought us to our present day and has caused a, a lot of problems. But there are still some people, some Jews, especially more of the progressive uh, Jews, what are often called reformed Jews, um, many in the United States, who want to hold fast to this idea that, hey, we don't, we don't necessarily need that place because who we are as a people is more of an it has more to do with an ethical orientation, living in the world um, to do one thing. When God established a covenant with Moses, and that covenant was our constitution, it's what constitutes us as a people, something absolutely new was happening. A group of slaves who had just enjoyed freedom from uh, from Pharaoh, we believe that Pharaoh was Ramses II. Ramses II was in, engaged in all kinds of building projects uh, uh, in the long reign that he had. But a group of slaves removed themselves from this land of Egypt, and they wander in the desert, a, a place that is 
completely devoid of any kind of no one lives in that desert today the sinai peninsula you know it's simply an inhospitable place <clears throat> nevertheless that's where they became a people and it had to do with their constitution a covenant and that covenant has maintained itself for over three thousand years with an orientation that says you know, we're people that worked with our hands. We, we weren't necessarily uh, literate. Nobody was writing things down. But there are 10 things that we can do as human beings. Every time we look at the tools that we've been given, we can think of 10 commandments that make us who we are. Four of those have to do with loving God. Six of those have to do with loving your neighbor. And so the hands that work the soil, the hands that, that work in the trades, are the tools by which the covenant is made manifest in the world. That's what it means for Israel to be a nation. Um, but that, that vision got a little bit, um, well, as, as with all human beings, that's a real slippery idea, isn't it? You know? We want a place because I can be identified with, you know, Nebraska. We have our own football team. We have our own uh, legislature. We have our own way of being in the world. It all has to do with our place. And that can be both a, an advantage and a disadvantage. So today we're going to see how that place association came to be what it is or what it was 3,000 years ago and what it is today. So just our, our review, um, last time we're, we're in week two, and we're going to now today look at the monarchies and probably get up to the divided kingdom. Last week we talked just simply about uh, how it is that Israel came to be with uh, establishment, establishing the Ten Commandments, that constitution, uh, and then how uh, uh, they found themselves in the desert, but... As well, you also have um, the story of Abraham, right? That, that foundational story. Avraham, a father of a great nation. That's what Abraham basically meant. Uh, when Abram was given a new name, Abraham, something new began. There was a sense that, you know, there was a purpose that Abraham had to um, fulfill in the world. And it was a purpose that wasn't necessarily established with one spot, one geographical um, spot, exactly. Um, so I'm going to go through my slides here. One thing I want you to remember as well is that when we talk about how it is the, um, the Bible was written, we, we naturally think the way we do history that somebody was writing things down as they happened. But when we look at the Old Testament, what we see is many strands of literature that were written or most likely memorized orally in the very beginning that spanned the time period from 950 all the way to about 500 BCE. And then finally, and here's the important thing, at a time when the Israelites had come through the destruction of their temple, uh, their first temple, had been taken off to Babylon and then sent back to Israel, back to Jerusalem. They had the opportunity to live in, in relative freedom under the Persians. There were, was a group of people, scribes, who decided they were going to take all of the materials that had been written from 950, and then some from 850, and then some from 620, and then a lot of the priestly material that was written during the Babylonian captivity Imagine a guy with a table, you know, and he's got all of these manuscripts laying out. And we're going to write the history of the nation. And this is where you try to decide, okay, when we're writing this history, we're not going to just objectively you know, write about a bunch of facts. We're going to write a narrative, a story that is going to inform us as to who we are. And this is where this redactor, and it wasn't just one redactor, this redaction took place, you know, from 539 to 333 uh, BC, BCE. 332 is when Alexander the Great uh, brought his troops down into uh, Jerusalem and, and started this whole process of Hellenization. 
but for roughly that time period when uh, the Jews were under the Persian uh, Empire, they were able to think critically about their identity. Who are we? So when we're reading the Bible, I mean, when we're reading the Old Testament, we're reading texts that, you know, have a long history. Some were written at this time, then later, you know. Uh, but then finally, what we're looking at is a text that has been redacted by someone who has a certain purpose that they want to, um, that they want to um, convey. And so the Hebrew Bible is very complex in that respect. And so sometimes you can read stories that um, you think are happening. Well, for example, the, the story of Ruth I'll talk about today. Ruth was written well after the Babylonian captivity, but the story itself actually is, is, is portrayed in the setting of the early, the time of the judges, uh, which was roughly between uh, 1200 and 1050 BCE. So someone in 500 or so was writing a story about things that were happening uh, 500 years prior to that. And the importance of the story is not so much the facts of the story, but the intent, what is the theme of that story? So we'll have a chance to uh, talk a little bit about that today. Um, just to remind you geographically where we are, uh, this is the so-called Fertile Crescent along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers down the eastern uh, shoreline of the Mediterranean, and then over into this fertile region of the Nile River Delta. Uh, as you know, uh, Moses and the Israelites were held captive in Egypt. This is the Sinai Peninsula, where they, uh, the story is told that they wandered for 40 years. Then eventually, as you can read in the story of Joshua, they come up on the other side of the Jordan River, and they recognize that this is the land that their father Abraham had been given by God. There are stories of conquest that take place. After that, Joshua is kind of one of those embarrassing books of the Old Testament, you know, because there's something called a ban uh, that happens where God tells the warriors, and there are all kinds of different peoples that are living here. You have Moabites, Amalekites, Amorites, Hittites. And they're all living in these small little, you know, uh, localized communities, most of them agricultural. Uh, the Israelites come to the land and know the story of, of Jericho. Uh, that would have been a Jebusite uh, region. Uh, and they, they, take the, they take the entire uh, city by storm, right? The walls come tumbling down. Everyone in there is killed except, interestingly, uh, uh, a prostitute. His name is, is eluding me for the moment. Rahab. Uh, Rahab. Yeah, Rahab the prostitute. <laughs> Right, and and so she, you know she helps them out. So it's, it's a story of great intrigue. But remember, the story wasn't being written as the events are taking place. <laughs> the story was being written in 620 BCE by the Deuteronomist, who at the time was trying to to tell the grand history of Israel and how it is that God had brought them through adversity. Interestingly enough, archaeologically. Uh, Jericho, at the time that this would have happened, we have no evidence that it was a walled city. So what do you do about that, right? This is the kind of thing that the uh, students in college would always just, you know, just walk out with a big cloud over their head. <laughs> this isn't true? And I'd always respond, no, the story is true. In other words, there are truths that are being conveyed. We're just not absolutely sure it's factual. There were no walls around uh, 1200 BC, around the city of Jericho. Jericho uh, is the oldest continuously ha inhabited city in the world. Uh, so you can imagine the archaeology that, that takes place there. So let's, um, any questions about that? I'm just kind of, that's a little bit of what we were talking about. Uh, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, uh, Moses and the, the, the establishment of the covenant. But let's now talk about that conquest of Canaan. Folks, there, I mean, you can take one of those chairs right there and or over here. Let's talk about that conquest of Canaan. Um, 
after the Israelites wander in the desert for 40 years, they brought up the other side of the Jordan, and then they entered the land. And through a series of conquests, as the Bible says, they established themselves there as a, um, a group of tribes, very loosely confederated tribes. Now, note how completely uh, innovative this is. Now, we're not talking about a democracy. We're talking about something called a theocracy. But they didn't have a king. But you have a group of tribes down here, Judah and Simeon, then another group of ten tribes up here, and they all recognize one thing, one constitution, the covenant. The covenant that God established at Mount Sinai. And every year, these confederated groups of people would come together and they would re-affirm uh, uh, that they were all bound by this covenant. Joshua 24, probably one of the best uh, you know, passages in Joshua. You will see it in people's homes. Choose, for, choose this day whom you will serve, but for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That was the confession that was made when groups of people would gather at, uh, you know, at, at very, well, usually it's most likely at various places, but they would gather um, and on, on a particular day and reaffirm their, um, their commitment to God. And then they would go back and they would live, you know, basically in, in their, a lot of them, this region up above is, is very agricultural. This region down below is, is kind of a herding uh, group of people. But they would live and be confederated. And if there were a problem, um, they would come together to, to help each other out. Now, try to imagine that this group of people was just simply one of many groups of people. One thing that made them different is that where the Amalekites and the Amorites would have little, what we might call city-states, you know, they'd be living under uh, the direction of a king. And this king was, you know, not somebody like Henry VIII. This king was usually like a warlord of some sort because there, was all, there were all kinds of skirmishes. The Israelites did not have a king. But in times of difficulty, when there was any kind of you know, problem on the landscape, when, you know, let's say the Hittites or the Moabites or you know, any number of those small groups decide that they're going to raid uh, the farming communities of one of the ten tribes, the people would come together under a leader that had been identified by God. So the Spirit of God would rest upon a judge. Now, this is a judge who does not adjudicate in a courtroom you're guilty or not guilty. But this is a judge who would um, listen to the Spirit of God in certain situations and would direct the people accordingly. Now, I haven't mentioned to you this uh, object that was very, very important that is believed to have been brought from the Sinai Peninsula up into uh, the Holy Land, let's call it, you know, where the 12 tribes are. This is called the Ark of the Covenant. It was a, um, well, I've got a, a, an image of it here for you. I can probably show it to you. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. <laughs> getting way ahead of myself. But, <laughs> uh, okay. This is what it looked like. Now, that's, Probably not what it looked like, but later on, you know, <laughs> you know, because it's all gold-plated and everything like that. But the important thing was, this is a container that has within it the Ten Commandments that were um, you know, given to Moses at, at Mount Sinai. And it was believed that this container was the throne of God. So as far as all of the Amorites and everyone else, they had their king, their warlord. God and God's constitution was taken from place to place in this Ark of the Covenant. Now, much later, uh, this, you know, if you read how you're supposed to design the Ark of the Covenant in Leviticus or Deuteronomy, uh, it has certain dimensions and it has these two, uh, actually they're supposed to be angels that are sitting at the, at the top, but they represented here by eagles. Uh, 
but it, it is literally the throne of God. And God was the king. God's covenant was the constitution. When there was a problem, when the Amalekites are, are, are raiding the, uh, the countryside, a judge would be identified by the Spirit of God resting upon him. And we, and we don't know what, how this necessarily took place, but we know, you know, Samson and Gideon and Deborah, you know those, you probably know those names from you know, some of the stories uh, that you've heard before. And this Ark of the Covenant would be taken by the people to the place of the conflict, and there the Spirit of God would, would rest, and through whatever means the judge had available, the conflict would be resolved. But it was done without a king. It was done simply because somebody uh, uh, accepted the spirit of God <clears throat> upon him and took up that leadership uh, position. Now, let me try to get back to where I was there for all this. we got a lot of good stuff to look at. I hope I can get through it. So, Well, that's all well and good until we go to the next slide here. You know, you have this theocracy where God is king. That's all well and good until you have a problem, right? The Amalekites and the, the people of Israel were roughly on the same footing. They lived in what was called the end of the Bronze Age, which was around, the Bronze Age ends around 1200 or so. Well, we know from uh, archaeological finds in Egypt that precisely at this time, in fact, the year is 1177 BCE, and there is um, actually a book that has just recently been published by Eric. I can never remember author's names uh, in the last in the last year or so. But it's called 1177 BCE, the year civilization collapsed. Kind of a provocative title, right? <clears throat> It is, um, if you don't think of civilization in 1177 BCE, but there were. I mean, you had the Egyptians who were building you know, pyramids, but they were disrupted and, and disrupted heavily by the coming of a group of people known as uh, the Sea Peoples. We don't know where they came from. The best guess is probably around uh, present day Greece and the Aegean uh, Sea area there. But they were very warlike. And these images here with these particular headdresses uh, represent uh, on an Egyptian, um, Egypt, Egyptian rock face, I can't remember the name of it, uh, the coming of these uh, sea peoples. Uh, they, they weren't uncultured. They weren't brutes. They weren't barbarians necessarily because they did have a very distinctive kind of pottery called bichromal pottery. Uh, in other words, the only pottery that we know that has two colors in it at this particular time. So they had access to some resources that obviously people in the Levant and Egypt did not have access to. Uh, we know from the Egyptian historical record, now this was on the side, you know, the Egyptians would carve so much in stone, and this has been reproduced this would have been the, um, uh, the conquest of the Sea Peoples or the attempted conquest of, of Egypt around that time, 1177 BCE. But you can see the boats, you can see here the people with their headdresses, and then the Egyptians going out to meet them. Um, this was a group that would later come to be known as uh, the Philistines. <laughs> And you might know of the Philistines because of two things. There was a big giant by the name of Goliath, right, and he was a Philistine. But basically the Philistines uh, were a, a group of seafaring people who settled along the coast. They settled along the coast, and they began from that area, a place today that we know as Gaza, Gaza city, it was one of the ancient cities. There were four ancient cities, five ancient cities there where they established themselves, the little city-states. And they would conduct from that area various raids. So let me go through this again and see if I can take you back to where we are. <laughs> Sorry about this. This area right here, you can see on this map, is called Philistia. 
if you were to look at a map today, it would be called Gaza. And this is, you know, the one area where we, we've got conflict happening as well. So um, it was from that area that they would conduct their raids. And remember, they have access to resources that are, are, are pretty advantageous. It's not just their pots, but the Philistines know how to do something that is a game changer. And they know how to smelt iron. We're looking at the transition from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age. So here you have your, your swords of bronze, and this is pretty good representations of what they would have looked like, the sickle-like sword here. Uh, and then you have this transition with a group of people who are you know, highly aggressive, and they're using materials that can utterly destroy these materials, right? That's a foe of gigantic proportions. That is a Goliath, if you will, of, a, of, a, of an adversary. And so here's a situation that has not arisen just yet. Uh, you have a group of people that are coming together. They, they've agreed that they're going to confederate themselves in times of great distress and turmoil. But now, oh boy. I don't know if we can really do this the way we have been because these Philistines are just overwhelming. So what we really need, we need a king. And this is a transition that is about to take place in Israel and one that is fateful, you might say. No, 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 we really want a king. Well, there were a group of priests at this time, and one of those priests, a uh, very famous priest, uh, was Samuel. And you can read the story of Samuel in, in 1 Samuel. I'll try to find this for you. And the people come together and they go to Samuel, who was uh, the keeper of the Ark of the Covenant. Whenever there would be a battle, remember the Ark of the Covenant would go to wherever the battle was. And, you know, the presence of God would be there. And hopefully the <coughs> Israelites will be victorious. But the people are saying, look, boy, these Philistines have these weapons. We cannot possibly... Uh, you know, just in the little skirmishes we've been having, we, we need some sort of centralized authority. We need a king. We, and by that, they mean we need a warlord. We need somebody who's going to organize all of us and, and form militias for us and, you know, and, and, and set our whole directive toward, toward fighting, toward warfare. And Samuel was like, ah, you know, but this, we're a theocracy. That's just... It's just not what we do, right? Uh, we are committed to the fact uh, that that God is our king. We don't we don't need a king uh, per se, a human king. Do you realize what's going to happen if you get that human king? All of a sudden, that that third commandment: "You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make no graven images." Now that starts to raise its head to the, you know, raise its ugly head. Because how easy is it for a king or a president, for that matter, or a leader to take on, you know, these kind of divine qualities, right? To the point where the, the king's word or the president's word or, the, or whomever, you know, the leader's word becomes, um, be, becomes the divine word. And that's what Samuel was concerned about. And so the people come to Samuel and it's so interesting how uh, how these concerns really are so reflected uh, in in our culture today. You know, everything is fine until there is a a threat on the horizon. Then the question becomes: Are you willing to give up some of your freedoms in order to be secure in? the world against a group of Philistines. I, when I came to Hastings College, I first started, you know, I, I started teaching in 2001. I had just moved from New York City. And uh, I had been in Hastings about three weeks uh, at 9-11. And this was so easy to teach at that time because we were going through it, right? Are you willing to give up some of your freedoms here in the United States, your freedom, right to privacy, and kind of things like that, in order to be safe from an external threat. 
and and we did. I mean, we we gave up some of those things. You know, remember what it was like going through airports before 9/11? I mean, you just kind of <laughs> just waltzed on in. You know, hey, can I go to the plane there and and, and talk to my mom and say goodbye? Like, yeah, sure, you go on ahead. Oh no, 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 we don't do that anymore, right? <clears throat> because there was a threat, and we said, okay, yeah, we better, you know give up that freedom to go onto the plane and say goodbye to mom. So this is what's happening in um, in a time of the judges. And so the people come to Samuel, and Samuel says, I got a warning for you. Listen to how (laughs) completely relevant this is. So Samuel reported all the words uh, words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap, to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his courtiers. He will take one-tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and his courtiers. courtiers. He will take your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to his work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. Now, how prescient is that, right? Sure you want to do this? Because you're talking about a game changer here. Not only is it an affront to God, who has established the, you know, the Ten Commandments and himself as a theocracy, but now you're doing everything that you tried to fight against or you tried to remedy when you were in Sinai. You're slaves. You know what it's like to be under oppression. No, no, no. We want a king. We want a king. So they got a king. And you probably know that first king was uh, Saul. Saul was from the the northern ten tribes, the agricultural tribes. But then the southern tribes wanted their king as well. And so they they anointed, Samuel anointed, a king named David. And the story of first Samuel and second Samuel is really has a lot to do with the conflict between Samuel, uh, excuse me, between David and King Saul. But eventually King Saul goes mad. He does not prove himself to be a king who would ha- who would act like one of the former judges, you know, doing everything according to God's plan. He would do things his own way, right? No, I, you know, God doesn't want us to take any... Uh, uh, you know, to take any prisoners or to, to take any loot from our, our, our destruction of cities. But I, I don't think, you know, we really need to listen to that. So he, he does it, you know. He starts to become his own um, uh, authority. And that becomes a problem. And as you know, absolute authority usually does, it corrupted him absolutely. Then along comes the pure king, David. And I say this with a little bit of tongue-in-cheek because... Isn't it interesting how uh, in First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings, the story of David, nobody holds back. David, you know, Saul was doing a lot of things that really, you know, lied against, went against the Ten Commandments. But you can count them on on your on your two hands the number of times that David went against the Ten Commandments. You remember the old, old Bathsheba story, right? Look at everything you were coveting, you were killing Bathsheba's husband, you were committing adultery, you were stealing, all of those things. So David was also an example of the kind of corruption that comes along with absolute authority. But it was David who was anointed, there was a civil war, and eventually David becomes uh, king of Israel itself. And David does something that's very important. He centralizes his authority geographically in a place right between the southern two tribes of Judah and Simeon and then the ten tribes up above, the agricultural tribes, in a city at the time that was called 
uh, Jebus. Jebus uh, in present is present day Jerusalem. There's the word I'm using. And the thing that made Jebus such a nice, you know, it, it's an outcropping of rock that sits over a pure artesian spring. So if you built a wall around that rock, if your enemies tried to seize, you know, or, or, or tried to, you know, wait you out, you know, surround the city, you'd still have access to pure water. And that's how David took the city. He went through these caves, you know, and then up into uh, the city itself, and then uh, took it for himself, renamed it Jerusalem. Um, and then brought the Ark of the Covenant into the city to be established as the central place where that Ark was going to stay. Now, he does thing, something that's a little bit arrogant. He builds himself a palace, right? And he's like, oh, my God, I'm going to build myself a palace. Meanwhile, the Ark is out there under a tent, you know, up on a hill. And finally, he kind of realizes, oh, boy, uh, yeah, maybe... If this is going to be a theocracy, maybe God should have a palace first, right? But by this time, the palace was already built, which kind of gives you a sense of, you know, David's own uh, hubris, I guess. Uh, he was the boy king. He helped the, to confederate the ten tribes to come together, the twelve tribes to come together. He slew Goliath in the story, and there's that famous Caravaggio painting of the young innocent david with his sword and then the, the giant head twice the size of uh, david's head of goliath there but centralizing the authority geographically but also politically you might know uh, this is actually this was a, a stained glass window that was in a conservative um jewish uh, synagogue um and uh, it pictures David bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. The story of, of David, the implication is that David is dancing naked, right? Almost drunk on the Spirit of God as he brings the Ark of the Covenant and establishes it there uh, in Jebus. Uh, and this is that image that I was just showing you. That, um, this is the throne of God, but isn't it interesting? It now sits next to the throne of David. So now we have some competition, right? And it's the same competition that we see in our own lives in 2023, right? We have the, the push towards a kind of Christian nationalism, or just nationalism in general. We saw that in Germany, right? Who, who really has the last word on, on the will of the people, on, on what the direction of the nation should be? Should it be our leaders who sometimes will just, you know, not even listen to what God has to say, or should it be God? And we, you know, we, we juggle these things and try to balance them out in ourselves. There are sometimes that the way of the nation isn't necessarily the way of faith and vice versa. So this is a conflict that we know quite well, right? But look what has happened also. Um, God has now become the instrument of the king. Before, God was a God of freedom, right? He, you could take the covenant, the Ark of the Covenant, wherever it needed to go. God had travel on luggage, you might say, right? <laughs> oh, we need to go up to Manasseh? Well, there's problems there. We will take the priest, we'll take the, the covenant up to Manasseh. Everything will be fine. Uh, God will come to the people. But now, the people have to come to God. And sitting right next to God is the king on the throne. Um, so as goes the king, so goes God, and vice versa. The king starts to, to take on for himself uh, some of the, um, of the glories and the honor that is due primarily to God. Now, I've, I'm, I'm aware of our time, and I, I talk rather fast, but it might, if I've lost anybody or if I've said something confusing, please, please let me know. Do you have any questions right now that I can maybe address? Any? <laughs> completely, completely uh, let's take a look at what this, uh, this temple would look like. David doesn't get to build the temple, and it will be, 
it will be the second Chronicles. Uh, no, it's first Chronicles 28 that we're looking at today, where David's son Solomon would establish the temple for uh, the, the housing of the Ark of the Covenant. Well, this is what it, it looked like. Here's the, the great big bat, the bat of purification that represents the, uh, the waters of creation, you might say. It's not going to be long, eventually, until this, this mountain up, on which the temple is situated is going to, to have all kinds of mythic overtones. Jews today even believe that this is the place that the world was created, where God you know, separated the darkness from the light and the waters from the, the land, right at the place on which this temple once stood. This temple is not there anymore. It was built in 960, uh, it started in 960. Um, it would eventually be destroyed by the Babylonians. Another temple would go up there. It would be destroyed by the Romans. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about what's there today. But only the priests now can go into the temple. Now remember that Ark of the Covenant, which is housed right here, is in a place called the Holy of Holies. God is now confined within three boxes, the temple, the inner chamber, and now the completely holy of holies, the inner chamber, into which only one person can go. Well, look at how manipulable that is, how easily that can be manipulated, right? The God of the people is no longer among the people, but now there are intermediaries between God and the people. The priests answer, answer to the king, and of course the priests are the ones who, uh, who represent God. Um, this is an artist's rendering of what that uh, fortress may have once looked like. Uh, and this is the first temple. Remember, there were two temples. This was the temple that would have been completed, well, by the death of Solomon in 922 or so. Here is the temple that we just looked at very little bit different in terms of its representation. Of course, here's the palace where David spied Bathsheba, where he and did all of his, um, uh, you know, just reflecting on what it meant to be a king. You, you do know that David's life ended tragically. There was civil war between his sons. Uh, he, he lost this, the first son with Bathsheba, but later his second son with Bathsheba was Solomon. Uh, became king, and it was Solomon who would complete this. Um, this is, you, you can't really tell, but this is kind of a temple mount here. Walls around the city, the springs below the city, so you have access to water, but you, you can see the, the various levels that one must go through in order to get to the, the place of God. Well, that today is, is housed in this place. That we know of as Jerusalem. This is a map of Palestine, Israel today. Uh, this is that area, Gaza, where the Philistines, you know, started their raids from. This is the so-called West Bank that uh, many Israeli, uh, typically, supposedly it's Palestinian, right? But there are continually more and more uh, uh, Israeli settlers that are going into the West Bank. But Jerusalem is kind of an odd duck in some ways. And many of you have been there, I'm sure. The city is divided into quadrants. You have the Muslim quadrant, then you have the Jewish quadrant, and then you have two uh, Orthodox Christian quadrants in which were, that has you know, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, for example. So if you were to go to Jerusalem today, that's, that's not a temple. I, I hope you know. <laughs> but as history progressed, or proceeded, maybe it's a better word for it, uh, we know that the first temple, the one that we were just talking about, was destroyed uh, in 587 BCE. The Jews were taken from Jerusalem and spent roughly 40 years in Babylon. And then when the Persians defeated the Babylons, King Cyrus of Persia said, you Jews, you go back to Jerusalem, rebuild your temple, do what you, you need to do in order to be the people that you are. So they go back to Jerusalem, and here's that temple mount. 
you know, you can pretty much see what how it matches up with what we were just looking at. This is west, this is east, south, and north. Um, and they started in 539 or thereabouts, actually it was probably closer to 500. They built another temple. Around 400 years later, a Roman uh, appointed king by the name of Herod would take that Jewish temple that was right on this spot and he would make it into the one of the great wonders of the world. And that uh, actually the, the completion of that temple was it, the temple was completed about the same time that Jesus would have been born. That temple, that Jewish temple, was destroyed by the Romans in 70 of the Common Era. And then for about 600 years, this whole area was just empty. Until this group of people, known as Muslims, uh, dealing that, that the, the Prophet Muhammad was God's final messenger, settled in Jerusalem, and it was they alone. They said, where was the place where God's temple was? And they found that Temple Mount. Everyone knew where it was. You know, it was the highest place in, in town. And then Way come, comes along the way, and they built here uh, a shrine, basically. It's the third holiest site in Islam, called the Dome of the Rock. It's believed in Islam that Muhammad took a night journey and... You know, was was taken up into heaven and there conferred with Moses and Elijah and Jesus and he was given instructions on how to start the religion of Islam and then he was brought back down to earth and he started that religion. This rock right here, the Dome of the Rock, is the place from, from which uh, Muhammad is believed to have ascended on that so-called night journey. So the Dome of the Rock uh, is a memorial to that, that journey, and it is in an area that is now controlled by, his, by, the, by the Muslim quarter. This is the Muslim quarter. This wall right here, you know, that was originally built around the, the temple, uh, most likely has its um, source with the Romans, but you may know this area down here is the, the Western Wailing Wall. This is the only, Jews are not allowed well, actually, they're allowed to go on the Temple Mount. They're not allowed to pray there. Um, so what they do is they pray here at the Western Wall, hoping one day, well, who knows? I mean, and this is, <laughs> but there are some Jews who are very, very fervent about the idea that they cannot be Jews until a third temple is built precisely on the place that this dome is now standing. Um, in the Six-Day War, 1967, um, when Israelis really took it to the Egyptians and the Jordanians who were uh, uh, fighting, the Syrians who were fighting them, the Israelis actually had the opportunity to blow up that mosque. And cooler heads prevailed. No, no, no. We'll leave it as it is. And, you know, you know we, 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 we seized the territory we needed. You know, we would gain more territory, but let's not cause World War III. So they had that opportunity. They did not use it. Now, this um, today, <clears throat> here's the Jewish quarter. This is the Muslim quarter here. And then this is the old city where the, uh, the two uh, Coptic Orthodox and, and uh, Russian or uh, Greek Orthodox churches are. Uh, this is where the Church of the Holy Sepulcher is. This is the, the, the Church of the Ascension. This is, if you go just a little bit this way, the place where the old garbage dump called Golgotha, the place of the skull, where Jesus was believed to have been crucified. So quite a, quite a place, right? Quite a city. Um, but this goes back to the story of David, right? And the, the, the story of, of Solomon. Jews believe that this is their land, right? Israelis. Muslims, or I should say Palestinians, believe, well, wait a minute, we've been, we've been here for quite some time and there have been no Israelis here. You know, it's only just been in the last you know, century that they've, they've started to come back as a result of something called Zionism. 
um, why is it all of a sudden that we have to give up our land? And this is the conflict that we're, we have going on. Um, so I want to stop right there. I know, and maybe all of you know this, right? Maybe all of you know this history. But I do believe uh, the more we re review it and remind ourselves of what this history is, and how volatile the situation is, uh, the more we can be informed about how we make some of our decisions and actually speak about the, the issue itself. Any questions about this? Comments? Who's, who's been to Israel? I know there was a, did you, did you guys went to Palestine too, or did you go with, with uh, Greg yeah. a couple of years ago? So did you get to go to the Temple Mount, or was that part oh, of it? Yeah, we were in the Temple Mount, the Wailing Wall. Yeah. Uh, we, um, we did get into the old, sort of, in the city. I don't remember being in the Muslim quarter, though, yeah. but we were able to go and walk around the Dome of the Rock. Yeah. Garden of Gethsemane over on the upper right screen, I believe, is that where it is? Across yeah. the valley there. Mount of Olives, right? Yeah. And actually, yeah, right up in the valley, there's a, a great Jewish cemetery right around the here, I think. Yeah. You may know. Yeah. The Mount of Olives is situated in such a way it's directly east of the Temple Mount. It used to be that if you were on the Mount of Olives, you could look straight into the, the Jewish, the second Jewish temple, you know. In a voyeuristic way, so it, it's symbolic that Jesus spends his last night on, on the mountain. Oh, well, well, the guy that was there, he said, the only place that they could absolutely identify precisely where Christ was in that garden. Yeah, and uh, uh, the, the trees are still there. Yeah, a thousand years ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. amazing. Must have been a great trip. Any any other questions of, or comments about this? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I think that the Nazis in World War II, with the extermination of the plans that they had for the Jews, yeah. caused this yeah. state of Israel to be formed. Yeah. And that, uh, well, uh, I lived in Munich. We, we both lived in Munich for three and a half years, from yeah. summer of 59 till October of 62. I went up to Dachau a lot to, to inspect the uh, MPs over up there. Uh, we toured the crematorium at Dachau, and they've got uh, spots outside the crematorium doors about six, eight feet in diameter yeah. that have plaques on them that say, the grave site of uh, many thousands unknown. Yeah. Yeah. My supply sergeant was a, uh, jumped on, on D-Day over the 82nd Airborne on Normandy and wow. was captured and uh, 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 market garden and spent the rest of the war in Dachau uh, oh, burning bodies and burying them, oh my gosh. scooping the ashes out. Yeah. So uh, I have no doubt that the crowds were responsible for the state of Israel being formed. Well, and that has a history that precedes World War II as well, as you probably know, and that is around the turn of the century, and especially in uh, Vienna, Austria, there were a group of Jewish intellectuals <coughs> who, uh, under, a, a, under the direction of a man named Theodore Herzl, who really began to think about this idea that we started with today. We can't be a nation unless we have a land, right? Mm -hmm. Now, that, that was a bunch of Jewish intellectuals who were saying that. But, you know, they had come through a history in which, you know, the 19th century and nationalism where nations were geopolitical entities and you know you, you had boundaries and that's what made a nation right they were saying you know we're God's people but we have no land so we need to begin to go back to our land and so in 1946 you can see these white areas here now this is before the UN plan divided Israel but this, these are settlements that are the result of that Zionist movement that began all the way back, uh, you know, around the turn of the century, the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. There were many Jews who actually, um, who actually escaped, you know, the uh, the whole World War II situation, you know, the pogroms and, and everything, by being Zionists, saying, "Yeah, we're we're with you. We're not going to go." But here's the interesting thing about it. Theodore Herzl was a Marxist, 
or at least he was informed by Marxist uh, philosophy. And the whole Zionist movement was an atheistic movement. They didn't want anything, any religion, to be involved with it at all. So, but after World War II, religion really started to enter into the situation here. And then this division of Israel, here's Israel and here's Palestine, of course, Jerusalem is about right here, and Jerusalem would have been controlled completely by Palestine. But then in the Six-Day War, Israel takes more and more of this territory. You've got part of the Gaza Strip here, and then you see the incursion of Israeli take, Israelis taking land that was originally plotted to the Palestinians. And then this is actually the most recent map that I could find that moves this is where we are, that's where we were 11 years ago. Uh, so you can see this expansion has, has certainly happened. And, uh, you know, I, I would prefer not to talk about the politics of all of it, but it, it is a very political, politically charged situation. Uh, the, the United States has, has perennially been a supporter of Israel. Now there's great conflict that's arising as a result of that. So, um, but I can't imagine what your experience must have been like. It was, uh, how long were you there? Oh, about three and a half years in Munich. Went to Dachau about once a month the last two years. Hmm. They still had the metal sign over the gate, our white mock fry, yeah. work will make you free. Right, that's sardonic Nazi humor. So, and any last comments? Well, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just saying that when we were there, the reason that they could not, that was, uh, what the Israelis told us, we took a, a tour after the, the people left, uh, Israeli said that we couldn't really annex the land because it, that even though they controlled during the war, because if you do that, then the people that live there have to be part of your country. And if they're part of your country, then they have to vote. They can vote, yeah. and so that's why that was land was never annexed. So according to your map, they're just kind of we're going away piece by piece by piece on this thing. It looks like right, yeah, yeah, exactly. And it, it, I never really could understand why people were so offended by all of these little cities that they're building in. Or these, yeah, and so that was it, just to take a, a piece at a time. Yeah, and these are the so-called the, the settlement of the West so, Bank. Yeah, um, and which are. Are, are little, I mean, there, some of them are, you, you know, they're, they're like islands in the middle yeah. of you know, this Palestinian area, and they live kind of this embattled existence, but feeling firmly convinced that they are doing God's will mm -hmm. in this uh, uh, situation fraught with... Um, well, the other thing that, they, that is not in the news, though, is when they put that settlement out on a hill someplace, you know, five miles from the border, they have to put a road there. And then they build a wall right. on each side of the wall. So there's a, and the Palestinians are not able to cross that wall. They got to walk around that yeah. thing. Yeah. Okay, so that's they're just divided a piece by piece like that. Well, um, we started with, we started three thousand years ago. <laughs> Here we are today, and you know, when you think of the time of the judges, the conflicts that uh, that prevailed at that time. And the conflicts that we still have, we're, we're still seeing uh, very similar conflicts. I mean, it's it's no coincidence. I'm sure you can see the connection between Philistine and Palestine, right? The Philistines of, of of years of old, the Romans actually didn't like the Jews that much, and they started calling this whole area Palestine just to kind of put it in their face. Right? You know, they want to call it Israel. So, so well, when we come back next time, we're going to look at how it is that the kingdom that Solomon and David were able to, to, to unify divides on itself. Uh, and this gives rise to a group known as the prophets who happen to be my favorite people. Um, I, I call that section of the Bible the flyover district, you know, like, <laughs> like the grand, uh, the great plains are. No one reads the prophets. It's so hard to understand, but in their historical context, they are really enlightening. So, uh, I hope you won't mind if I end in just a brief prayer. That's great. Gracious God, we're thankful for the opportunity to live in a place where we can worship 
you freely, where we can express our opinions, where we can come together and learn about your word. We ask that you be with us throughout the week. Fill us with your spirit as we work for the furtherance of your kingdom and the restoration of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.